So today what we're going to do is we're going to look at the life of David. But I want to show it from the perspective of uh, my own imagination, if I may, if I may, use my creative freedom to describe this for you. Let's get to the very beginning of David's life. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 16. Because one thing I love about David, he's by far one of my inspirations. He's one of my favorite uh, people to read about in the Bible. Because he has so much that happens in his life. And I believe that in the Bible, he's one of the very few that you get a chance to kind of grow up with him. You see the very beginning of, uh, of his life. Well, not the very beginning when he's born, but you see him uh, when he's just a teenager. And you get to the point where you see him in old age. To the point where he basically gives his last breath. That's that's why I love the book of David. That's why I love David in the book of Samuel, because if you get a chance to really see what was the purpose that God had for him, which brings me to my first point, God's purpose. But here in 1 Samuel 16, verse 1, we get a chance to see the origin story, the genesis of David. And it reads here in verse 1, the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I will, am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and he invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called uh, Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. And this is such an incredible moment because this is the anointment of David. But I can only imagine that Samuel here gets sent to, to, to go visit Jesse. Now, during this time, Saul was the king of Israel. And at this point, God has rejected Saul. He no longer sees him as his king. So then he then sends Samuel to go anoint the new king. And I can only imagine this moment as he's going through each son, he begins to see, like the Bible says, the outward appearance. Now, this is one of my favorite scriptures actually to share with the brothers and to tell them, hey, yes, God looks at the heart. That is true. There's no doubt about that. But men and women look at the outward appearance. So what does that mean? There is still some value there. Because still, people need to have that sense that they're following someone that they want to imitate. So I tell, my, I tell all the brothers that I lead and I disciple, my dear brothers, you guys have to care about your physical appearance. Not in the sense of like, hey, you have to look, look a, a certain way to appear to certain people. But what matters is, is that they have to care themselves about themselves. What does that mean? Hygiene. What else does that mean? Getting haircuts. What else? Well, making sure their ties are on tied right. Making sure their bow ties are clipped on right. Making sure that these brothers care about the way that they come off. Because they are the ambassadors of christ how can you be an ambassador of christ if you don't have any respect for yourself so there is still some value in the outward appearance because man does look at that and it's an it's unfortunate but it's the it's the reality 
Now, I thought I, I thought I looked a little deeper into it because I'm pretty sure in this moment, David felt some type of way because he was the one that was left outside tending the flock. He was the one that wasn't even considered to be in the presence of the last judge to have ever lived because that's who Samuel was. He was the last judge. After him, there was no more judges to live because that, then that started the periods of the kings. So Samuel was the last judge. He then appears to Jesse and then he tells him, hey, where are your sons? He shows them one by one and he sees the physical appearance and he thought for sure the oldest of them all had to be the leader. He had to be the one that was going to be the king. But of course, God rejects him. So then Samuel gets a little confused here because he's like, wait, I've met all your sons. There has to be another one. And I began to think if we put ourselves in David's shoes, how would we feel that our own father didn't even consider to call us in for dinner? Our own father didn't even consider to call us in and to put us in the presence of the prophet of God. And I began to think to myself, if I was David in that moment, I would have began to think of all the insecurities that I had riddled in my mind because my father didn't even think to even consider bringing me in so that I could meet this man. Not because I want to be anointed king, but just to meet him, just so that I can feel that much closer to God the Father. So then I began to look this up. What are the major insecurities that us as people have? Well, let me give you the top, the top five. So the number one insecurity people have is that they believe they're not attractive enough. That something about their facial features are just not at par with what the world tells them that they need to look. And then the second one is that they're not fit enough, that their body is just not the shape that the magazines tell us that they need to be. Third is our social standing. Where are we amongst our people? Do we have friends? It's kind of crazy because people now use how many friends you have on Facebook to determine your value or how many followers you have on Instagram. It's kind of crazy because these are now the features that people look for in order to find some value in themselves. But in reality, these are all the things that people on the outside are valuing them. So it's not even how they see themselves. It's how they want others to see them, that they have lost their sense of identity. And number four was the financial insecurity, that if they don't have a certain amount of digits in their bank accounts, that their value is not significant. But then I saw a quote. There's a quote out there that says that how much would you be valued if it, that bank account was zero? Would you still have the same value? And the last but not least, the value is just your health. There's an insecurity in your health. There are some people that unfortunately have been born with certain issues. Now, for example, in my case, I'm lactose intolerant. I'll be honest with you guys. There was an insecurity with that. Everybody would always say, hey, guys, let's go get, let's go get some ice cream. And me as a kid, I'd be like, oh, man, I just got to make sure that as soon as I'm done eating this ice cream, I'll go home. <laughs> I'm not about to do this in front of my friends. But there's an insecurity when it comes to it. But what's so crazy, though, guys, is that we look at these things. And um, I remember this one time, there was this sister that asked me this question that I thought was really funny. She said, Israel, have you ever imagined or, or pondered the question? Why did God make you a boy? And I began to ask, I began to think, I was like, I was like, you know what? You know what? That's actually a good question. Think about it. Think about it for a second. God, God actually thought this through, right? So he specifically designed you to be a boy and for some of you to be designed a girl. And he wanted you to be the specific genders, but that, it goes even deeper than that. Because now he, he picked the exact color that you want, that you needed to be. Not only this, not only the color, but then your ethnicity, your nationality. I began to think to myself, well, then, yeah, why, why wasn't I born Nigerian? I was like, I love the food. I love the culture. I was like, man, I'm surrounded by them everywhere I go. I was like, there has to be something with that, you know? But it's such a great question because God specifically designed every single one of us to be the color, nationality, and the gender that God wanted you to be. Because he somehow believed that that is the role or gender or ethnicity you needed to be so that one day you'd make it to heaven. 
that he thought that the best odds of you making it was to be who you are. Isn't that crazy? So then these insecurities that are, that are just circulating the world are totally made up. They're subjective when you really think about it because every single one of us isn't born looking the same. We aren't designed in a way where we look like the people in the magazines. And to be honest, we have to accept it. We have to be surrendered to that fact. So I started to think in David's situation, apparently the Bible says that he was handsome. He had handsome features. Now, just because you have handsome features, I was thinking, does that equivalent that he was handsome? Maybe he just had really nice ears. Maybe the handsome feature he had was he had a really cute nose. Because when you really break it down, these are just features. The Bible could have just said he was handsome, but it didn't say handsome. It said handsome features. So there's probably parts of David that maybe were a little off. Who knows? But the thing is this, though, regardless of your background, regardless of your size, your color, your height, God has a purpose for your life because God has designed a path for every single one of you to one day end up here in this room. Think about it. All of us were reached out to by somebody that probably didn't even look anything like us. And somehow, some way, we trusted this person to, into a Bible study. And then after that, we didn't even care what the person looked like because all we cared about was the word of God. Because I'll be honest, I, I was, sometimes I forgot that the person was even there because as he would read the words of God, I just felt like God was talking to me. I didn't care what he looked like at that point. And I'll be honest, the guy that studied the Bible with me looked a little sketch. But I'm so grateful for him because if it wasn't for that man, I wouldn't be here today. And I began to think like, man, all these insecurities probably began to creep up into David's mind. But then either way, it did not matter because the moment that he stepped into that room, Samuel looked at him and he said, come here, I'm going to anoint you king. But the crazy thing about it, though, is that every time, every time you guys come to Sunday service, every time you take a step into this, what we call church, that is God calling you into his house. But do you view it that way? Do you view this moment or these times every Sunday as special? So I began to ask myself, what, is this, what if this was my last Sunday service here? What would I say to you guys? What would I want to say to my family? Because all these, all these insecurities begin to riddle your mind. I begin to think, what does God have in store for me? But I began to think that every time I step in this room, We see the people that we love. I genuinely see you guys as my family. And I'm, I'm just so grateful. I'm really, really grateful. You know, uh, yesterday at Kimo, we had so, so much fun. I'm so grateful for Keelan. Uh, he bought us the wristbands. Um, <laughs> and uh, it, it was really awesome because uh, we got a chance to go on all these rides and everything. It was, it was just a great time. But I remember I told Jen this morning, um, I would have been content just to have been there and not have gone on any rides. Just to be the chaperone, to be the one to see you guys having fun, to see you guys yelling. And to be honest, even seeing some of you guys overcome your fears. There were some people that were too afraid to get on some rides. Uh Hey man, there's there's this dear brother where uh, uh, he he got on he, like he's like I'm not getting on this ride no matter what you say, and hey man, let's just say Miles is a very persuasive brother, <laughs> very persuasive. <laughs> uh, it got to the point where Miles said that he had to go through him in order to get off this ride, and I don't know if you want to go up against Miles, uh, but eventually this brother made a choice to get on the ride and to, and I gotta say you know it was I'm really proud of Kenneth over there. <laughs> But it's so awesome because just seeing, seeing you guys get on these rides and having so much fun, it began to help me reflect on this whole time that we've been here. To get a chance to see you guys overcome a lot of fears. 
seeing a lot of you guys come up here and speak for the very first time. I was so proud of the, the we, we this last Devo, we had a Young Guns preach off. We had four brothers preach. We had Sandin, we had Angel, we had Adrian, and, and, and we, we also, oh my gosh, how am I forgetting this? This is terrible. And we had Keelan. So sorry, brother. But we had these four brothers come up and preach, and a lot of them don't even speak. It's the very first time they get a chance to say something. But it was so awesome to see them raise up and overcome those, you know, jitters. I was so impressed by these brothers. I was so, so impressed. Because that right there showed me something. Like, that was the beginning of a new era. It's the beginning of the new leadership raising up. Those are the leaders coming up. And I'm excited because there's still many more brothers that are ambitious to come up. I'm super proud of Tony trying to raise up. I'm, su I'm super proud. I'm super proud of no Manning. Like there's so many brothers that are still waiting. And don't worry, the sisters will get their chance to preach. I heard a lot of sisters saying like, when's it going to be our turn? When are we going to get a chance to go up there? But don't worry, that time will come. But I just got to say, I'm just so proud of you guys. I'm so proud of the campus ministry because of seeing where they started. Remember, when we first got here. Amen. Let's just say we had to sort through some shenanigans. But either way, though, it's just so awesome to see where they're at now. And that right there just shows me that the beginning of God's purpose in their life has only just begun. In the same way that David anointed, that David was anointed here, God has anointed you guys to be preachers, to be those visionaries that this church needs. Because without you guys, there is no HICC. We need you guys. We need you guys to raise up. We need you guys to preach the very words of God. Because you guys will be the ones to usher in a new era. And I can't wait till one day you guys just kicking us out of this room because you guys are leading your own service. And when that time comes, I'm going to be a proud papa. But not only that, so turn your about to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Because not only do we see David get anointed, we then see David go on to one of his greatest tasks is, is slaying Goliath. Now, we've all heard the story of him slaying Goliath. We see good versus evil. We see a, a little boy. Roughly, I looked up the average height of people in, during that time. It'd be roughly five feet. So, and you have to imagine that that five, five foot three was a, gr was a grown full adult, male. Think about that. Five foot three was a grown man. David at this point in time was not a grown man. So I could only imagine. I could only imagine that maybe he was a little shorter than five feet. So for those brothers that are a little short, don't worry. Amen. And then he had to go up against Goliath. Goliath, they, they believe to be somewhere around six foot nine. So a six foot nine man up against practically a little boy. And we see these two go up against each other. And I love this passage here. If you turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel 17, verse 45. And the Bible here reads, David said to the Philistine, the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that this is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. And I love this passage because after the point that he got anointed, he believed. He believed that he was called by God to do something even greater. Because in this moment, when Goliath was defying the armies of God, nobody wanted to go up against him. Nobody wanted to battle the giants. And I began to think to myself, what were the giants that I had to face on my way here? What were the giants that I had to slay in order for me to really believe that I can lead this campus ministry? And I began to think, oh, one of my biggest fears was failing as a husband. Because I'd never been one. I'd never seen a good example myself. So I began to think, what if I fail as a husband? I'm so grateful for Jen, you know. I'm telling you, this woman puts up with a lot, you know. 
and I hope hopefully not too much. But it's so awesome to have her by my side. But there was those fears that began to creep in. These insecurities that I didn't even know were there because I've never been there. So I began to think to myself as like, can I really be a husband? Do I know what that means? I mean, do I do what I've seen on TV? Do I do what I've seen my dad do? Do I do, I do what I've seen my, my uncles have done or my grandfather? But to be honest, most of my uncles aren't even with their first marriages. Uh, my, my, my grandfather, from what I know, for the most part, he was, a, he was known as a town drunk. Like, honestly, like, I, I grew up surrounded by men that probably would not know what it means to be a good husband. I love my father and I respect him a lot. I believe he was a great father, but as a husband, there was moments where he failed. So I began to think, like, where, where do I get this example? Who do I look to? I began to look at the word of God and there's no manual. There's no step one, step two. But, there are, but the Bible is riddled with ways of how to treat your wife. And I'm so grateful for, for Matthew and for Jose for just being great examples. And for Jarius, there's many moments. There's many moments I had to go to Jarius because this is a man that has been through a lot. And he has a lot more experience than I do for sure. Because not only does he have to be an awesome husband, he has to be an awesome father. I hope to be there one day and imitate you, bro. Uh, but I began to think, like, how, how do I? What do I do? How do I do this? What do you need? And I'm so grateful for her because she's, so, she's been so patient with me. So loving, so caring. Like, honestly, guys, she makes our home a home. There was a time where, that I've shared in the past, but she was gone for a few days because her sister graduated from high school. And we only had enough to afford for one ticket. So she went to go, you know, support her sister. And I had to live on my own for a, a few days. I'll be honest with you guys. I can't do it. I can't go back. I just can't. But in the same way, there's many of us that have Goliaths to slay. We have a lot of Goliaths that are in our way and it looks intimidating. They look big and scary. Some of us, it could be our own sin. For some of us, maybe it's a hard time to forgive those that have hurt us within the kingdom because there's some of us that have been hurt. Let's be honest. Uh, we're, not, we're not perfect by any means. You know, I know I definitely ain't. Like, you could ask my wife. Uh, there's many of us that have hurt each other and we got to forgive one another. But not only that, we can't view our brothers and sisters by what they've done. We got to view them the way that God views them. The moment that, that God saw David, he didn't care about the outward appearance. Instead, he looked at his heart. He looked at the inward appearance. He wanted to see that David was so much more. And that's what he did. And I believe that's why he picked David, to show everybody during that time that this little boy, can become, can become something greater if he just believed. Because when you really think about it, nothing happened to him. It's not like the moment he was anointed that he got taller, that he got super strength, and that those appearances got a little bit better. Nothing changed. Nothing changed. Just some oil was put on his head, and after he took this first bath, it was gone. After that, it was all up here. He had faith. He had faith that he was called by God. In the same way, every single one of you needs to have that level of faith, that you've been called by God. You've made mistakes. I get it. This summer probably wasn't the best summer. You probably have tanked it really hard. And amen, I know some of you have because you've told me. But, but don't let those failures define who you are. Don't let the insecurities tell you who you are. Because those insecurities will eventually be the things that you're going to find strength in. Some of your greatest defeats will be your greatest victories. But it all begins with you seeing God's purpose behind it. Because even in those moments, there's a purpose behind it. It's kind of crazy to think that for some reason, God designed you the way you needed to be. And he designed you to have certain sins that you struggle with. Now, I'm not saying that God put those sins intentionally to tempt you. He doesn't tempt you. But there's certain weaknesses that we do have. But those are the weaknesses that we have to overcome to build something we call character. 
And we need character. Every single one of us need character. Which brings me to my second point, a man after God's own heart. Now, one thing that I'm really excited about is, uh, is actually uh, this moment here where, where David uh, goes and faces Goliath. You know, we've all heard the story. But what's so incredible about this moment here is that this was his opportunity. His opportunity to show his faith in God. But I can only imagine what was going through his head. In this moment, he had to be the representation of God to fight Goliath. But I'm pretty sure maybe that thought crossed his mind. Maybe. Who knows? Of what if he failed? What if Goliath killed him? There was a deal that he made with Goliath. That if he was to die and lose, that everybody in the Israelite army would become his slave. If he was going to die, every single one of his brothers, his father, his friends, would be Goliath's slaves. The pressure was on. He felt all the pressure. Because he understood that if he died in that moment, if he would have lost, every single person there would have had to be under the control of the Philistines. It would have been a very sad moment. All that pressure of failure, the insecurities, the fears, the shortcomings. Because think about it. He tried on Saul's armor and it didn't fit. What does that say? He doesn't have the size of a soldier. He does not look like a soldier. He can't fit the army of a soldier. He can't even hold the weapon that a soldier would hold. He could even hold up Saul's sword. It was too heavy for him. It's crazy because some of us here want to be leaders, but we don't even know how, how to hold our own Bibles. We don't even know how to actually find the right scripture to disciple someone. The moment somebody comes to us and they tell us they're struggling, the first thing we want to do is correct them based on our own thoughts, based on our own judgment. And the, the, the thing that we forget is to bring out a scripture. You guys got to know how to use your Bible, how to wave that sword. And if all you have is that one scripture memorized, use that one scripture. Find a way. Find a way to disciple somebody. If all you learned from the first principles was Psalm 119, just use that. It says, hey, you'll be blessed. Just hold on to God's statutes. That's all you got to do. So if the person comes to you and they're like, hey, I'm struggling with sin, just hold on to God. Seek him first and you will be blessed. If someone comes to you and they're like, hey, I'm struggling with greed, just stick to the whole, stick to Psalm 119. Blessed are those who seek God with all their heart. Just seek God with all your heart. So what does that mean? Give God first. Give him your first fruits. If someone struggles with coming to the meetings of the body, just go to Psalm 119. Tell them to seek God. If that's the only one you've got, use the word of God. Stop going off of your own ideologies. Stop going off of your own principles. Use the Bible. That is something we're missing, is using the very words of God. So here in this moment, David had to believe. He had to believe. And I'm so excited because we're beginning to raise up mighty men. And I'm so proud of them. And I'm so excited for the way that they're going to grow up and do incredible things. But they are the ones that I also want them to hear, that they got to know their Bibles. They have to use their word. Because what if one day they get into a sword fight and I can't be there to protect them? And I've been there to protect them a few times. They have to know the ins and outs of false doctrine. They have to understand that a person must become a disciple in order to be saved. They have to be a disciple, get baptized for the forgiveness of their sins so they could then receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They got to know how to use their Bible to show them how that actually happens. But that's the thing. How many of them can get up right now and defend their faith? And that's the thing I want them to do. I want them to be equipped. They have to be equipped. They need to be the mighty men to slay the Goliaths, but even slay the Goliaths on campus. They have to be prepared because the semester is coming up and they have to know how to protect the flock. They have to be the great shepherds, to be those that not only protect those that are inside of the pen, but have to go and find those that have been lost. Turn your Bibles to uh, here in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11. But here in 2 Samuel chapter 11, I love this passage because we get to see actually one of David's greatest defeats. 
But I believe that this even is a great example of a man after God's own heart. I'll explain. Don't worry. But here in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, we see one of the moments where David really fails. Here in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, the Bible reads, In the spring at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the, the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged R Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanliness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived, uh, the woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. And in this moment right here is one of David's biggest mistakes. It's unfortunate because we see here David, in the, during the time where kings were supposed to go off to war, he decides to stay home. He decides to check out. He made a, a huge decision here. He decided not to go to war, not to go into the battle with the brothers. He decided to stay home. And one day, as he's walking around, he, puts his, he stumbles upon Bathsheba. But I begin to think that in order for this to happen, David had to really think this through. David counted the cost. As he's walking around, he had to have been looking for this. You see, guys, when it comes to sin, it's, it's out there. It's out there, and sometimes we say we stumble upon it. Or sometimes we say we fell into sin, but in reality, we have to first really think about it. We have to think about it, count the cost. I, I don't know if you guys do this, but I'm pretty sure we weigh the pros and cons in our head. That if I do this, these are the consequences, but then also these are the, also the, the emotional gratification that I'll get if I do it. Or maybe some of us do it because we're in a tight pinch and we just give in. But what's so crazy is that David had to really think about this. But David's a man that the Bible says is a man after God's own heart. He's seen many victories. He slayed Goliath. He's, he slayed many soldiers. He's fought for the army of God. Now he's king and he's leading God's people. If anything, he has like one of the best connections to God. And it says that the Lord was with him. It's crazy to think that even this man falls into sin. He makes a big mistake, or some would say a mistake, but in reality, it's not a mistake. He went and committed this. He was looking for it. After giving into this, he then makes an even bigger mistake by trying to cover it up. What's so sad is how he tries to cover it up. In order to do it, he calls in Uriah from the, from the battle that he was at, and he tries to convince Uriah to go and sleep with his wife so he can cover up the fact that she's pregnant. Now, Uriah the Hittite actually was one of his mighty men was actually one of his close friends because David would only call those his mighty men, those that actually fought in battle with him. So that means that in some shape or form, David fought with this man, meaning that he was in a battle with him. They probably have slayed people together. That means they've had many voyages where they've gone off to war and come back home together as brothers. That's why he knew who to call and how to get him actually back home. And he knew the ways to try to convince Uriah to give in to the sin. But no matter what, Uriah loved him so much and respected him so much that he wouldn't even leave the threshold of his palace because he wanted to protect his king. Eventually, David makes a choice that he had to cover this up because he didn't want anybody to find out. That he sends out Uriah to the worst part of the battle and Uriah gets killed. But what's so sad about this is that, is that David, even then, still doesn't see the damage he's done. Because then he then takes Bathsheba, and she then eventually does conceive this child. But what's so sad is this child actually doesn't get a chance to even live a life. This child never even celebrated his first birthday. He never even got a chance to ever even go through the concept of puberty. This poor child never even got a chance to be raised by his father, the king, and his mom. This child died before he even had a chance to even hope and dream. Because, in, because of David's sin, it killed many. 
And sometimes that's what our sin can do. Our sin not only kills us and eats us in the inside and decays our bones, but it hurts those on the outside. It got Uriah killed. It got the baby killed. Not only that, but then the people around him, I'm pretty sure felt some type of way about the leadership. And I think sometimes we can feel that way about the leaders in our lives. We can look at our leaders and think that they failed us and they've hurt us, that we begin to lose trust. We begin to look at them a different way. But that's the thing, though, guys. Even us as leaders, we make mistakes. We have sin. We have sin. But it's not to say that, that I'm saying that this is a license to go in sin. By no means. We don't let this grace go without effect. We don't go looking for it. We fight the temptation. We fight the desires and the wills to want to go and give into it. But that's the thing, though. Even in those moments, you have to run to your brothers and sisters. You have to run to those that are willing to hear you out. Those that are willing to be in the battle when nobody else does. Because even in this moment, I'm pretty sure David probably tried to find a way out. But of course, the prophet Nathan had to come up to him and confront him with the sin. Now, let's look at how David then responds. Go to Psalm 51. Because what I want to do is kind of look at the little cracks and the little parts of David that we don't get a chance to preach about very often. We know that he slayed Goliath. We know that he fell into adultery. But I want to give you a little deeper insight on this and how he lived out God's, God's purpose in his life. Here in Psalm 51, we get a chance to see, because we have to understand that the Psalms are, are songs and poetry. So this right here is David really pouring out his heart. He was, he was a bit of, a, of an artist, a bit of a poet. Uh, he wrote a lot of the Psalms. So we know that here David is kind of pouring his heart out. And this is what he had to say. In Psalm 51, verse 1, it said, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict. And justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me. A pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Drop down to verse 17. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. And I love this passage. I love this moment because this, is, this psalm was written moments after he failed. You see, this is what it means to be a man after God's own heart, is that even when you fail, you get back up. Even when you mess up, you go back to God. This is what it means to be a person after God's own heart. Many of us, when we fail, we don't want to get back up. When we mess up, when we give in to that temptation. You see, this is by far one of, great, uh, David's, one of David's greatest victories, actually, is it, getting, getting back up. It's choosing to fight all over again, even after he's messed up severely here. As the scripture says, turn your Bibles to Proverbs 24. This will show us what it means to be a righteous person. Now, some believe that the book of Proverbs was written by Solomon, and I, I, I do stand on that. I do believe that as well. Uh, you can make an argument for another case. But here in Proverbs 24, verse 16, I imagine that this right here is, if this was written by, so if this was written by Solomon, well, this was the son of David. I'm pretty sure uh, Solomon heard of all the mistakes that his father made. 
it was written in the Bible. But here in Proverbs 24, verse 16, so it reads, For though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again. But the wicked stumble when calamity strikes. I imagine that David messed up so much that he told his son. Because we know that Solomon was one of the wisest kings to have ever lived. Meaning that this man probably asked for a lot of advice and had a lot of questions. He probably went to his father and was like, Dad, why? Why did you mess up? All David could honestly say is, son, I messed up. I failed. I failed not only as a leader, but I failed as a father. I failed as a husband. But I got back up. I chose to get back up. It says that the righteous get back up. Meaning that hopefully after falling so many times that you fall up, you get back up just one more time. But it's so crazy because this is implying that the righteous fall in the same way that David fell. Many of us will fall one day, or maybe we already have. We've fallen. Maybe some of us even within the congregation have fallen asleep spiritually. And it's on us guys to really make a decision here today. I want you guys to make sure that before you leave, you make that choice, that you want to wake up, that you want to be defibrillated, that you want to really go after the word of God. But you have to go after your relationship with God. And you have to be surrendered to the purpose that God has in your life. And that purpose may not make sense to you in the moment. And sometimes, I'll be honest with you guys, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me either. But I understand that God has something even greater for us. Because something that's so amazing about this is that we get a chance to see the ins and outs of David's heart. This is a man after God's own heart, but it all began with having a contrite heart. Having a contrite spirit, a broken spirit. Understanding that our way is not the right way. Understanding that, honestly, sometimes when the leaders come up to us and disciple us, it's for our good. Even though it may not feel good, it's not based on your emotions. Brings me to my final point, a life worthy of the gospel. Turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. Because when it's all said and done, guys, I think that's all we want. All we want is a life worthy of the gospel. For someone to be able to reflect on our life and to see that we were that person, that no matter what happened, no matter the circumstances, no matter who was leading me, I still went back to God. Because that's what it's all about at the end of the day. It's all about God. Don't make it about the leaders. Don't make it about those who are leading you. Don't even make it about those that are above you. Just focus on God and God will take care of you. God will protect you and God will put the people that you need to have in your life. No matter the circumstances. But but here in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. I love that this was also the heart of Paul. He says here, whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I would know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. It's crazy because here Paul even tells you that you will face struggles the same way that I have. But whether whether I'm there or not, you have to keep going. In the same way, if the Karanzas or if Jen and I are not here, this church has to keep going. You guys got to keep fighting. The leaders got to keep raising up. And you guys have to keep becoming those mighty men. No matter who leads you, no matter what happens, you have to keep fighting. Don't make this about people. Don't make this about personalities. Because that is where you make a mistake. When you put all your hope and faith into the people. Because transitions do happen. You have to have the faith. You have to have the faith that that God will put the right people in your life. Because you have to live a life worthy of the gospel. I love that Paul here would say that because he is a man that definitely did live a life worthy of the gospel. 
and I can't help but think of this movie. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the movie Saving Private Ryan. Uh, but it's an incredible movie. It's a military movie. Highly recommend watching it. Uh, Tom Hanks is in it, in case you were wondering. Uh, but what's so, what's so awesome about this movie is that um, it begins with uh, this scene where there's this old man where he goes to his uh, tombstone, goes, goes to a tombstone. And the purpose of the movie is that he sees this tombstone. And, and in the beginning, you don't really understand what's going on because he's old at this point. And you'll get, you'll, later on in the movie, you'll understand what kind of happens. Uh, but then scenes after, you get brought back to a flashback where there's this man by the name of Captain Miller, where he has to basically assemble a team to go and save Private Ryan. Because what happened is that the Private Ryan had, old, had uh, several brothers. I believe he had four or five. And all of them, unfortunately, died due to the war. So because he was the last brother alive, it was like a rule that they had where they... Uh, they didn't want a, a, a parents to completely lose their entire lineage. So they had to save the last living son. So this little battalion goes and, and unfortunately, one after another, you know, they go through some gruesome things. And little by little, they all begin to dwindle. And what's so sad is that at the very end, uh, as, as Private Ryan has Captain Miller in his hands, and he's basically on his deathbed. The, the last words that Captain Miller tells him, he's like, he's like, make it worth it. Make it worth it. And then you get back to the scene where he's an old man looking at the tombstone. And he looks at his wife at this point. He's, he's, he's old. And he looks at her. He's like, was I a good man? Was I a good man? Because he wanted to live a life worthy of the sacrifice of those before him. In the same way, we got to live a life worthy of the sacrifice that Jesus made. Not only did Jesus make this sacrifice, but all those before you. There were those that actually came way before any of us. And generations and different generations will come to this church. There's a new generation coming up and that I'm so excited for. But either way, though, eventually one day that generation will pass and a new one will come. But it all depends on the culture that we set now and the culture that we then pass down to those that come after us. We have to be those that, are, that live a life worthy of the gospel. And in closing, turn your Bible to 2 Samuel, chapter 23. We now get to see the very ending of David's life. We're going to look at David's last words. What's so special is that David lived a very special life. David saw a lot of victories, a lot of defeats. He had to get back up after falling several times. Many times, this man even got to a point where he lost his kingship. He lost to his own son. Either way, though, after tanking it so much and getting back up, falling, even his kids getting into all kinds of sin, he understood that he had to keep fighting the good fight. And in closing here, David's last words, 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 1. And the Bible reads, these are the last words of David, the inspired utterance of David, son of Jesse, the utterance of the man exalted by the Most High, the man anointed by the God of Jacob, the hero of Israel's songs. The Spirit of the Lord spoke through me. His word was on my tongue. The God of Israel spoke. The rock of Israel said to me, when one rules over people in righteousness, when he rules in the fear of God, he is like the light of the morning of at sunrise on a cloudless morning, like the brightness after rain that brings grass from the earth. If my house were not right with God, surely he would not have made with me an everlasting covenant, arranged and secured in every part. Surely he would not bring to fruition my salvation and grant me my every desire. It's so special because here, he says that he lived a righteous life when we know that he didn't quite live one, right? But yet it's because God fulfilled a few promises that he had for him. One, that he'll blot out, blot out all of his transgressions. At the end of the day, guys, the moments that you come out of the water, your sins are completely forgiven. God forgets about them. Because it says that love holds no records of wrong. What does that mean then? Then God holds no records of wrong. The moment that you sin, I'm not saying go and abuse God's grace, but, the, but 
Don't allow the sin to determine who you are and who you will become. Because God sees you so much more than that. If I can only part you with some final words, was don't let your sin define who you are. All of you guys are so incredible and so talented. I'm so proud of every single one of you. And I love you guys all dearly. And I'm so grateful for everything you guys have done for me. But just understand that you guys got to keep fighting the good fight. So that one day you can say the same words that David said, that his house was in order and that God fulfilled that everlasting covenant with him. And to God be all the glory.